Hello and welcome to today's video. I have created this video based on popular requests based from my previous video that I did towards planning schemes. So if you haven't watched the planning schemes video, I would highly recommend you watching this first before you watch this lesson. The reason why is that when I am talking about how I plan lessons, I often refer back towards how I plan schemes as they kind of come hand in hand. Planning lessons is something that is the most, I think, popular concept that teachers are always thinking about how they can adapt, as essentially it's the biggest thing that you do on your day-to-day -day basis, you are teaching lessons. So I've decided to give my advice towards my 10 top tips towards how I create my lessons and some of the advice that I have. At the end of today's video, I'm going to include an example of a lesson plan and how I can show you how I do this in practice, so please stay tuned to the end of the video. Without further ado, let's move on to the tips. Number one, think about your outcome and then your objectives. So stereotypically, when it comes towards a lesson, there should be an outcome and there should be an objective. I can't see there being a situation where you create a lesson and you aren't thinking about these. When it comes towards outcomes and objectives, I find it easy to think about the outcome first. So by the end of that lesson, what do I want pupils to walk away with? And what do I want them to have achieved? Once I have that outcome for the end of that lesson, I then think about the way that I would structure my objective. So the way I structure objectives, and this has been based very much upon the score that I'm at, but it's actually a really useful way to consider objectives, is either this is an inquiry question, so the wording of the objective is in a sense of a discovery question. So what are we going, what do we want to discover during today's lesson? So it can be worded as an inquiry question, or it can be worded as a generic normal learning objective in the sense of the structure might be to be able to blank, 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 so that blank, blank, blank. So think about your outcomes and your objectives is my first tip. Before you think about any of the tasks, you want to think about what the outcome's going to be to help your actual structure of the lesson. Which leads very nicely onto tip number two. Think about the structure that suits your outcome. Now, it's very traditional to have a starter, then a main body of the lesson and a plenary. And this is how I still tend to plan my lessons now. I have some sense of a short burst starter activity that often will either link to the previous lesson or will get them thinking about the concepts for today, if it's a new topic. The main body, which is filled with a variety of tasks, or it might just be one longer task, depending again on your outcome and the style of the lesson. And then having a short plenary so that I can solidify the learning for the pupils and also for them, them to be able to raise any misconceptions if they have any by the end of the lesson. Not saying that they won't raise misconceptions during the lesson, but you hopefully get the idea of what I'm saying there. Now the structure should be very much based upon what you want the outcome to be. So for example, this is where you want to think about your tasks. If by the end of that lesson, you want pupils based on their prior knowledge to be able to answer a 20 mark question, for example, and you know that 20 mark question will take them in timed conditions 30 minutes. So if your lesson is an hour long, you already have taken away 30 minutes of that lesson. If you want to have a starter and a plenary activity, you then want to think about how long they're going to be in order to aim the main body of that lesson in order to achieve the outcome. Now, this is where, like I've said, you really want to think about the outcome when it comes towards the types of tasks within the lesson. If it's very much based on an assessment lesson, so you want them to be able to show their assessments, it is in timed conditions, I would recommend that I sometimes do a lot of my assessments, I have a very short starter activity and I get the assessment completed. That's if it's an assessment that they've been working on for a few lessons pr prior. The reason why I do that is that I know that sometimes I can end up falling into the trap of not having enough time to actually complete the assessment which is the main body of the lesson in order to achieve that outcome. But that's just me and that's based on the way that the scheme, for example, that I would structure would work. 
you've got to be like I've said just be mindful of your outcome and the tasks that you're going to need in order to achieve the outcome which leads me on to number three it's been quite useful that all these are linking towards each other you might guess when you've got your tasks think about your timing timing is key and I don't mean you've got to be rigid with your timing but be aware about, about the amount of time you have in the lesson now this is the interesting part the amount of time that you have in the lesson be accountable for the things that you can't control so for example the lesson might last an hour but if you're a secondary school teacher and for example your lesson with your year eight class takes place at the end of the day and you know that their previous lesson they're all the way over in another classroom that's a five minute walk be accountable for that also be accountable for the fact that it's an hour start to finish and be mindful of the short interruptions that might take place that might not allow the lesson to be an hour in its fullest. So that's where your timing is key. So think about the main task that you want them to complete and that should be the main focus. If the starter isn't the main focus of the lesson, that's why your timing needs to be key. So keep your starter short if it isn't something that is massively going to impact that outcome. If it is, spend more time on it. But you will know what the outcome is. So be mindful of your timing and how much time you actually realistically have. We can all fall into the trap of planning an hour, sticking rigidly to that hour, and then realizing I actually only, by the time the pupils have got into the lesson, sat down and are ready, wait, 10 minutes has already gone. So be mindful of that. This leads me on to number four. Adapting is key. And I think number four is the hardest thing to get your head around or to become confident with when you are first starting off with teaching because I know that I struggled with this myself. I am somebody that is a perfectionist. I stick to plans and I was so worried that if I came away when I first started off my PGCE, if I came away from the plan, that would be a bad thing. However, the plan is there before you are in that classroom. And we all know that when you're in the classroom, delivering the lesson that you had planned at home or at your office is going to come across maybe differently when you are in front of the pupils. And that's because you need to adapt towards the environment, what's happening on that day, and also the learners in front of you. So it might be that you thought in your head, this task might only take 10 minutes and it takes a lot longer. That's not a problem if actually it's going to fulfill the outcome even further. If it's something, for example, pupils are struggling on, it might be that you need to add an extra activity before you move on to something else. It might be the complete opposite, that you've planned an activity and actually you've realised, oh, the pupils don't need this activity anymore, I can move on. So it's being mindful of adapting. And my one tip when it comes towards how to adapt and sense what's going on in the classroom is having a moment where you step back and just visualize what is happening visualizing what you can see from the pupils their body language their responses the atmosphere within the room that should give you a good indication i think sometimes towards what's needed within that moment number five plan for the learners in front of you which i know is difficult when you don't know the learners at first so that's why don't feel like you've got to get everything perfect from day one. It's difficult. We all make mistakes. No teacher out there will go into every lesson and get everything perfect because things happen that are without our, that are completely out of our control. Second sense of that is that actually, in order for the lessons to be effective, we need to get to know our learners. So that's why I always make sure that within my first few lessons with any new group, I allow activities that I can get to know them a little bit more and know where they're currently up to. Sometimes it might be the case in fairness that you within your department that you have been given notes about the current pupils progress which is an absolute bonus but also thinking about the energy that that pupil is giving off in the time that you've got them. You know if you think about secondary school I know that for example I taught classes in year seven I didn't teach them in year eight and then I picked them back up in year nine. I was aware, I was able to know from the teacher what skills they knew and where they were currently up to. However, people can change. We can change within two years. So it's being mindful of the learners that are in front of you. Number six, and this is something that I'm still trying to improve on today, energy. Now you're probably wondering, 
Why does energy have anything to do towards lesson planning? Think about the tasks that you are planning and how much energy that's going to require from you and the pupils. I know sometimes I can find myself working a lot harder than the pupils in front of me and maybe that's down to sometimes the tasks that I am planning and what they need within that moment. So that's why adapting and energy kind of come hand in hand because you can read the energy from the room to read the energy within yourself and think about actually it's the pupils that should be working here. If if I'm doing more work than the pupils then I, there's, there's something not quite right here because they should be the ones that are learning. I'm not saying that at all you should be sat back doing absolutely nothing within your lesson plan and going off you go. That is not what I'm saying at all. But thinking about moments where you give your energy and then they give their energy. Energy, effort, I see it more as energy. Really think about that within your lesson plan. You don't wanna have an hour's worth where you are working and working and working, haven't got a chance to breathe, and actually the pupils are doing less than you. Think about it when you're lesson planning and when you're in the lesson. Number seven, so when you've thought about the task that you want to deliver and the style of your lesson, the structure, the outcomes, think about your visual presentation and your resources. So I plan these in advance and have these prepared. Now the reason why I'm talking about this as a tip is that sometimes think about the things that need to be visual and the things that need to be printed out. Sometimes I used to find that I was printing stuff out for the sake of printing it out. So I'm thinking, why? Do I need to print this out or could it just be on the board? At the same time, sometimes I would realize there's so much information on the board that are they really going to be able to remember every single thing that's on that board if I want them to remember it? Does it need to be printed out? So think about your visual presentations and your resources that you're going to have in hand, whether they're printed or books, you get the idea hopefully. Number eight, if you aren't engaged in the lesson, how can you expect the pupils to be? Now I know sometimes that there are lessons that you yourself might be sitting there thinking, okay, this is gonna be a really difficult lesson to make fun. And I think most lessons should be fun, but there are some times where, let's be honest, if a kid is having to do an exam, they're not gonna be ecstatic about doing that. So it's thinking about the lessons, making them as, as engaging as you can, and giving off the energy that you want from your pupils. So even when it comes towards those lessons that you know pupils might find a little bit less engaging, it's thinking about you within that lesson. If the pupils can find you engaging and can connect towards you, I think it makes things a lot easier when it comes towards finding that element of engagement. Number nine, this kind of maybe should come before the others, but oh well, it's something to always be mindful of about the prior knowledge of the pupils and the future knowledge of the pupils. So this kind of comes more towards your scheme of learning. However, the reason why it comes towards lesson plans as well is that once you've got your scheme and when you're structuring out your lessons, you need to obviously be mindful of how those lessons fall one after the other. So when you're on lesson five of a scheme, what do they already know? And what do you want them to learn in the future? So it should kind of all link towards one another in a few senses. The reason why it's important is that there's no point having a starter activity and it being something that doesn't link towards anything or having a starter activity that they're always good to have as recaps but be mindful of there's only so many times you can recap certain things. So for example I think the hook in the lesson will be in that starter. You, you want them to get hooked into the lesson from the get-go. So your starter activity might be linked towards prior knowledge, but be mindful of the way that you structure it because it might be that a pupil sat there feeling like we've covered this so many times. I'm not engaged. I already know this. So just be mindful of the prior knowledge and the future knowledge that you have for the pupils when it comes towards how you plan your lesson and thus the activities that are there that are going to engage and are purposeful. Yes, it's good to recap, and yes, it's good to extend pupils' knowledge, but just be mindful of the way you structure things. I think the one way that I find to really inspire pupils towards motivating themselves for their future learning is having take it further tasks. 
So within a lesson, I always have take it further tasks that are applicable to absolutely anyone. It's not an extension activity. I repeat, it's not an extension activity. A take it further task is something that a pupil can do right then, right now, to extend their thoughts. It doesn't have to be to write a few more sentences. It's something that is woven in with the main task that can allow them to have a higher level of thinking. So my take it further tasks might be an evaluation task. So whilst you're working, evaluate. It might be, can you consider using this prior knowledge element within this work? It's not an extension activity. It's not, now you've done task one, two, three, four, and five, I now want you to, as a take it further, do six, seven, and eight. The reason why take it further tasks are really beneficial when it comes towards future knowledge is that they can sometimes develop on skills that you're going to cover in the future before you even got there. So you can really allow to stretch your learners even further in the lesson, which is differentiation essentially. And my last tip number 10 when it comes towards lesson planning and being within the lesson, trust yourself. Trust yourself in the lesson that you have created. If you start to doubt yourself when you're creating the lesson or when you are in the lesson, the pupils will read off that energy. And I have fallen into that before and it's okay if that happens to you. Essentially, when you are delivering lessons and tasks, you want to be secure on yourself that you know what they are. There's no point in you delivering a task if you're going, I don't really know what this means myself because how can you expect the pupils to do it if you don't know how to do it yourself? And the one recommendation I have towards trusting in yourself is don't be afraid to ask for help from your colleagues or opinions. So it might be, for example, if you are collaborating on lessons. So it might be a case that you have lessons that you are delivering that you have collaborated with with another colleague. And we all structure things differently. And it might be that you're looking at the lesson going, I've got no idea what this means. Ask ask that colleague, say, you know, I'm not too sure what that means or how would you deliver this? It might be, you know, asking the question, how, how would you go around this thing? That's where trust comes from. I'm gonna add a bonus 11 onto this, 11. I was gonna stick to 10, but 11. Ask for help, ask for advice, and don't be afraid to be inspired by other people. Reach out. It might be that you're really struggling to think of another way to deliver a concept and the way that you're delivering it or the task that you had planned isn't working and you're sat there after that lesson thinking, I don't know how to recover from this. Ask for help, ask for opinions. I really love the fact that in the department that I'm in that all three of us have different experiences. I'm an RQT in the sense that I'm not only the youngest, but I've been teaching for the shortest amount of time, but that doesn't mean that my head of department won't ask for my opinion or my advice and vice versa. Teaching isn't a one rule suits all. Teaching isn't a one method of teaching works for everybody. This is where you find yourself in teaching and I'm inspired by looking at other people and their lesson plans, but does it mean it's gonna suit me? No, but that doesn't mean that I can't be inspired by it or I might actually sometimes watch something and take it away and think, how can I adapt that within my own lesson? So hopefully these 10 plus one, <laughs> Tips when it comes towards lesson planning have been useful for you when you are considering creating your first lot of lessons. Now, I know there's less of a structure here, but what I'm going to do at the end of this is that hopefully in a few seconds now, I'm going to insert some examples of how I plan a lesson and a structure that I use. So please stay tuned. I'm gonna talk this through um, like this. So this is my first lesson, for example, and this would be a year 11 lesson. So I'm starting off with this 32 mark response. So I know that's what my topic is. So remember I was talking about in my scheme about topics, that's what the topic is. And this is what my lesson is gonna be. So this lesson is focused on the learning objective in the way of to be able to explore key moments from Jane Eyre. So that's what we're aiming to explore so that we can evaluate and consider the effectiveness of these moments for a 32 mark response. So this is kind of what we're gonna be looking at during the lesson so that they can achieve this for their outcome. So for example, I start off with this starter activity that's very short, it links back to their prior knowledge, it's thinking about writing bullet points, and again, like I've said, I've already provided a TIFF activity 
activity. So something that can stretch their thinking whilst they're watching it. I always provide an alternative um, starter task. So something that if they're struggling with, I know the video is not working. Um, so that's what I've done. Then this is the main body of the task. So this handout, what I would um, do within the lesson is that I tend to, a lot of my resources I have within the PowerPoint. So this is a resource that I would present on the board, but I would also print this off for pupils because I know that this is going to be something they're going to be referring back to at a later point and actually they can focus and look into it in more detail in front of them. So this would be a resource that I would print out but also have on the screen. This is, again, another resource that I would print out for them because it's something that they would use all the time, but something I'd go through on screen. So what you're probably noticing with how I create my lessons is that within the same PowerPoint, I have my resources that I would talk through and present on the board and also print off and also just tasks that wouldn't be printed off. So this wouldn't be printed off. This is one of the tasks. So I try to keep it, um, it's probably not coming across on that well on the screen, but I try to keep it, um, I don't try to have too much information on there. So the task I keep very simple, I word it so that if the pupils have forgotten what the task is, they can look up again. So I have task one, I explain what the task is, um, I explain what they're going to be using, and then I, this I would print, I would print off, or I'd write on a whiteboard, but this is the main um, body of the task. As you can see, I provide them with a support, so I differentiate here. Um, they know this through the use of TIP or TIFF, and I provide an indication through the pictures of what resources they might need to use that have already been printed out. Again, I continue with um, the tasks and what I've done in this lesson is based upon what I want the outcomes to be, I have provided tasks that if I have enough time, I'll work through task two, task three and the plenary. However, I could just shorten it down with the amount of time that I focus on and I could skip ahead. But as you can see, I've also provided a TIFF task that can be considered throughout all of these tasks as well of having the tip there. So that's a lesson that follows more of the structure of a starter, the main tasks within there and a plenary. This is very ambitious, like I've said, to complete it with an hour. That's why I know within this lesson, I would adapt with my timing and adapt with the amount of time I spend on the tasks. So I'm now gonna show you an example of an inquiry question. So the learning objective, so this is still the topic, the title of the lesson, and this is my learning objective. So it's more of a question. So it's not the to be able to and so that, this is a how can we, so it's more a question that they will ask and they're hoping to achieve by the end of that lesson. So I have a starter activity here that I would present on screen and this links back to their previous lesson. So this is lesson seven within the scheme and they would have looked at this previously in lesson six. So it's a short burst activity. This isn't the main body of the lesson. So when it comes towards adapting time, I would perhaps break them into pairs, break them into teams to shorten down this time. This is just to allow them to refresh their minds from last lesson. But like I've said with timing, this is focused on male leads from the last lesson. It's good to help them with their structure, but actually it's not that important towards the objective. So I'd be careful with my timings. So this is a resource that I would have on the board and the task is below. So they'd have the pictures there. Um, I might print out, in fairness, the pictures for them. Um, however, because there's not that much as you can visually see on this slide, it doesn't need to be printed off. The task is always here. And as you can see below, I've provided a take it further and a support. So no matter who is going, who is going to complete this task, they have a stretch tiff that they can apply to this task to make their work a higher quality or to extend their responses, or if they're struggling with the task, a support. So this really helps when it comes towards energy. So if they're struggling, they know that they can go towards the support first. And then if the support is working, I can go over and give extra support. So it's thinking about the energy that you're providing. You're providing them with things that they 
can work towards if they're struggling or they want stretching so that your energy can be spent in the right places. Again, task two. Again, this would stay on the board. I would explain it to them. And again, as you can see, there's a TIFF and a support task. And that actually would be the lesson. So in this lesson, there isn't actually a plenary. And the reason why there isn't a plenary here is that my plenary will continue into the next lesson. So it will act as a starter. And the reason why I haven't made a plenary in this lesson is that I'm very accountable of the learning inquiry and what I want the main body of the lesson to be. I want them to be able to solidify this learning. So my plenary might be for them to share back their answers based upon what they have so far, but I haven't physically put it into the lesson plan. So I don't want you to feel afraid that just because you haven't got it within your lesson plan, your PowerPoint, doesn't mean that you haven't got a plenary there. Just because it isn't visually presented doesn't mean that you can't add it on. So that's where it comes towards adapting, essentially. So hopefully just seeing these two types of how I would structure a lesson are very useful. As you can see, I'm just going to skip through this whole PowerPoint because as you can see, the PowerPoint is actually my scheme of learning. So within this whole entire um, PowerPoint is my scheme. So all of my resources are within the scheme, within each lesson. I've scheduled it very clearly as lesson one, lesson two, so that I can pick this up or any member of staff can. I know and I add it through the notes which are resources to be printed out. I've got my homeworks on there as well. So this is how I plan my lesson plans and it kind of weaves in towards the scheme as well. So I hope that today's video has been useful and if you do have any questions please do not hesitate to ask and I look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.